The last year has been a momentous one for all inhabitants of Scotland. So far, so good. Including the rare and endangered animals that call this place home. So ginger, 100% belongs in this country. At Edinburgh Zoo, go! And Highland Wildlife Park. <laughs> Dedicated staff have been at the forefront of conservation for over a century. No matter how big the job, the first of many. Or small the species. There's a special place in your heart for the small things. So you drop the tank, you mess it up, game over. We'll meet the 260 strong team working to preserve over 3,000 unique animals. I like Kato more than I like most people. I'm obviously especially in love with Sale. A job in which no two days are the same. You're wondering what I'm doing, aren't you? Oh, he's right behind you again. <laughs> Every moment is cherished. Getting the chance to work with these guys is incredible. Dream job. <laughs> They're super cute, so it's all worth it, really. Welcome inside the zoo. Carry on, Zuki Pink. Hippos and hoverflies. Snow leopards and snails. They're all part of Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park's commitment to safeguarding our most threatened species from extinction. We're the ones that have, have caused the havoc in the world. We're the ones that are causing these populations of all animals to decline, so it's up to us to find a way of fixing it. And for a lot of species, captive breeding programmes is the only way to do it. <laughs> Having baby animals to look after is just the best thing ever. There's nothing better knowing that one of your females is due to give birth quite soon and coming in the next morning and there's a beautiful baby there. And it's just the best feeling in the world. Most of the bird species will tend to start their breeding behaviours in spring. So that's yeah, usually a nice indicator that we're ready for the for the busy time of the year, and uh, that's the fun part for us all, really. So. <laughs> but at Highland Wildlife Park near Aviemore, the only zoo in Europe dedicated to animals adapted for cold weather, spring still seems some way off. Perfect weather for polar bears. Not so much humans that have to move polar bears. With breeding season for the bears fast approaching, Arctos, one of the park's two males, is to be moved from the enclosure he shares with Buddy Walker to be with female Victoria on the other side of the park. He's over 600 kilograms just now, so um, getting him into the crate is going to be a bit of a bit of a workout. There's risks involved, of course, that we've taken into account. It's as safe as it can be. Uh, but it's always a worry, there's so many moving parts that uh, one wee thing that can go wrong can have a big effect on the whole operation, you know. Pretty much everyone, including maintenance staff, will be involved. But a small team of vets and keepers are heading in first to give Arctos an anaesthetic to knock him out for the move. Oh, yeah, the rump's the best, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, I and mean, you can use shoulder yeah, and stuff. Here, but... With Arctos already in the holding pen, where he's used to interacting with keepers during training sessions, ensuring he's as relaxed as possible is important. Stress can make it difficult for anaesthetic to take effect properly. What are you doing, mister? We need your bum, though. Darting duties today fall to carnivore headkeeper, Vicky. We wanted to dart him in the rump. There's a lot of muscle there, um, so the, the drug is administered in, and, and absorbed through the muscle more effectively. So I had to make sure I got that dart in the right place so the drug would take effect quickly. Walker is, um, even though they have their differences, he's like, he's long term social partner so he'll be being a bit protective so you can you, you might be able to hear him calling and chuffing and it's he's worried about what's happening after a short wait arctos appears to be fully asleep nothing so far no nothing so far okay and happy that he is the team swiftly move in Ready, one, two, three. 
What, are we going under his legs? Yeah. <laughs> just, just right round his arse. Using strong canvas straps that won't cut into Arctos, it takes the intense effort of 16 people to firmly but carefully manoeuvre him into the crate. He's got it. It was actually really smooth. I think better than maybe last time we did it. And this time the crate was modified so it opened at both ends. Five minutes later, and everyone has made the half mile trip across the park. We'll give him a, bit, a wee while just to kind of come round in this area. Then we'll give him access to the smaller outside pen. And then before the day's out, we'll probably give him access to the main enclosure where he'll see Victoria. You good over there, Vicky? Um, yeah, this is the yeah, open here. All right. Okay. All right, good open it up. <laughs> Somewhat grubby, but none the worse for wear. Where's my second breakfast? <laughs> Prospective dad to be is soon heading outside. Oh, good work, everyone. Left to begin the process of looking for Victoria and doing what everyone hopes he'll do. In Edinburgh, there's another male waiting for a first date. Four and a half year old Luku is a Sumatran tiger. Critically endangered, they're the most at risk of all tiger subspecies. They're also the smallest tiger, tending to be more aggressive and highly strung than their larger relatives. And if you get close enough, you can tell a Sumatran tiger by the way the black stripes on their hind legs split in two. Luku's recently arrived from Painton Zoo in Devon as a potential mate for the zoo's female, Dharma. He's a nice boy, he's lovely, and we hope that um, this year we get them paired up and, and hopefully uh, breeding, which would be absolutely fantastic. But today's task for Luku is a training session with Alison and Michael. You know, you can't just um, open a tiger's mouth and have a quick look at its teeth if you think there's a problem there. Whereas if we have our animals trained in such a way that on a daily basis we can run through a, a, a training programme with them, get them to open their mouths, um, get them to come over to us, then it allows us to check over our animal really, really thoroughly and it allows animals to participate in their own care. At the moment he's, he's worked out we have a heated rock in the outside enclosure, so on a day like today where it's dry but there's a wee bit of a cold nip in there, um, he quite enjoys uh, just lying on the heated rock. Some animals take really well to training, and there's a surprise waiting when they get to the tiger house. Hello, look at you. What a lovely boy. Like any domestic cat, big cats also need an annual booster injection to protect against common but potentially fatal diseases. And Luku's is due. We want to get him into the crate and get him feeding and get him so that he will press up against the side of the crate so that we can do an injection. Now, he is trained for this, but he was trained in his previous place. So, um, this is new to him, a new setup, a new training crate, new keepers, probably doing new signals. So, we just need to be very patient with him, but he's being great. A calm and gentle approach is important to gain Luku's trust. So he might be a wee bit nervous, but that's fine. We just talk to him and allow him to smell and get a wee reward. They're extremely dangerous animals and we do work up close with them, but we have very set procedures and protocols um, that, that allow us to do this in a safe manner. Um, I've been in the industry over 33 years now, um, but you still pinch yourself at times when you know, you're sort of standing there and there's an extremely large, amazing tiger in front of you. Good boy. That's it. Using chunks of meat to reward him, Alison wants to get Luku's rump against the wire nearest to her. The best position for the vet to give him his jag. So I'm going to touch, OK? Touching. 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 Good boy. OK, I'm going to try a little bit just with the other slightly more pointy end, just to see if we get any reaction to that. 
tight. I'm, I'm pushing in, he's pushing back against me, which is quite good. And I'll do one more, Michael. And then I am, so you ready? And ready to off. Good boy. The training session there was, was fantastic. Um, and it might not look like we did a huge amount, but for him it's a massive amount. It's the third time he's been in the training crate. Training is, is so much better. You do tiny little incremental steps towards your end goal. And it's so much better doing a session like that. It's very short, but very positive, moving slightly forward. And he comes out of it basically going, well, I didn't have to do very much there and I got a little meat reward. So next time, yeah, I'll come in. Edinburgh Zoo's iconic penguins have been a feature here for over a hundred years. All hailing from the same part of the world that includes sub-Antarctic islands and the tip of South America, they come in a range of different shapes and sizes. The king penguins were the first to arrive in 1913. Then there are the northern rockhoppers with their fancy yellow crests, and the less flamboyant Gen 2 penguins who are keeping a close eye on the keeper's antics. On this very special day in the Gen 2 annual calendar. <laughs> First of March every year, we put down these hollow rings in rows on the nest site and the Gen 2s will fill those nest rings with stones and then that'll be the, the launch of the green, green season. I think if we start out here, look where you're getting to nest this year. All the excitement. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've come along a wee bit. <laughs> this is the hard bit. Yeah, so about there. Yeah. We can straighten them all up yeah. once they're down. Oh, look at them all. oh here they come. <laughs> we have a mixture of um, solid concrete nest rings um, and we've also got fibreglass uh, rings as well. So we've got about 23, 24 concrete ones to put out, um, which obviously is a lot heavier work than the fibreglass, but the, the birds actually prefer the concrete ones. It's easier for them, the small chicks, to get up and into the nest uh, with their nails on the concrete. Out the way. Out the road for two seconds. Not, not quite that much out the road. <laughs> with nearly 100 Gen 2s to cater for and a commitment to sustainability at the zoo, these nest rings have been in circulation for decades. Just say if you guys need a break. Some have even survived from the 1960s. For the penguins, perfect positioning of the rings is key to the nesting process. Even before the nest rings go down, they will be sitting in the middle of where their nest should be. Um, and although we try and remember as best we can where the nests are year after year, for a lot of our birds, if we didn't get it exact enough, then they wouldn't be happy with it. <laughs> they, would, they would sit at the side and wait for us to move it. <laughs> With excitement mounting, it appears love is in the air. You'll see a lot of this um, bow hissing behaviour. So that's uh, a courtship. So it's when the pair come together. Um, they'll come to the nest together, they'll sort of bow, and they'll make a hissing noise at the same time. And that's them essentially establishing that nest as theirs and their pairs are coming together. The pair might not speak to each other all year <laughs> or associate with each other all year, but as soon as that nest ends goes down, they'll come straight back together. With all the rings down, it's time for the penguins to do some work. They'll be filling these nests now for the next wee while. Probably for the rest of the week and into next week, they'll be constantly working on those nests and perfecting them ready for, hopefully, eggs. Maybe the end of March, we normally see our first egg being laid, so yeah, it won't be long before they're then incubating. And then, and then that's really genuinely kicked off from there. <laughs> At Highland Wildlife Park, it's the day after Arctos's big move to be near Victoria. Here we go, hello. He just looks like the perfect bear. <laughs> and keeper Emma has been monitoring progress. Yesterday, just after we'd had lunch, we popped back up with the vets and 
had to look at him, he had the holding pen in the den and because he was looking quite good we gave him his side of the enclosure as well. Um, so he had a good explore, um, very noisy, looking for Victoria, seeing what was going on. When he was doing his roaring sound it was actually echoing back off the mountains. He, he got quite loud and it was so beautiful. And all that roaring got Victoria's attention. She came over and had a good look at him um, and he was getting quite excited along the fence line. Um, she was a little bit shyer, um, so we're still looking for a little bit more of an interest from her before we decide to mix them. Um, so I think we'll probably leave it for today. Um, I think Vicky's thinking maybe over the weekend. Actually though, she's just walking over, so this is perfect timing. <laughs> It's sort of friendly, like, he's been non-threatening. But Victoria's not entirely impressed. So she's a little bit huffy, so it's different from the chuffing he was making. So that's more of a, more of a huff towards him rather than the chuffing. It's not totally negative, but she will do that when she's not totally sure. There's not much else poor Arctos can do except cool down a bit. I do actually really love bears, that's what I've always loved, so um, getting the chance to work with these guys is incredible. Um, dream job. <laughs> As well as the polar bears, there are another 28 species of animal to be found at Highland Wildlife Park, ranging from hoofstock and carnivores to birds. Capercaillie and cranes, the great grey owl and the Eurasian eagle owl with its distinctive ear tufts and orange eyes. And keeper Emma, as it turns out, isn't only mad about the bears. This is really my first experience of working full on with birds. Um, I am really enjoying it and I'm starting to learn a lot more about them, which is really exciting. Um, the eagle owls are my favourite. They're quite serious, but they can also be quite goofy as well. So I really enjoy getting to know their personalities and working with them. They are both boys, although originally we got them as a pair. Um, they thought that one of them was female. It was a wee while before we found out that they're both boys and their names are Roger and Lyra. Um, so like from the dark materials, they are 31 and 33, um, so they're both um, quite old in the wild. I think they live to in their 20s sort of age, um, so they're definitely a lot older. Because animals in captivity live quite a lot longer, it's important to make sure that the long life that they have here is a really good one. Um, so things like enrichment and enclosure design are really important. Emma's got a plan for some trees that have been felled on site. And fellow keeper Sophia is here to help with the heavy lifting. So we've got um, quite a few branches that we've picked out for the owl enclosure. Um, and I think we've got some new bark coming in. So um, we'll be able to make it look a lot nicer for them and um, have a lot more options for feeding them and stuff, just to vary it a bit. I remember starting like as a volunteer and I was absolutely knackered. But you just get fitter and fitter, I think. Yeah. <laughs> day of working as a keeper. Suddenly, there's a bit of a kerfuffle over at the crane's enclosure. Come here. A crow has got its wing tangled up in netting and is stuck fast. OK, I got you. I got you. Oh, well done, then. Oh, that's there amazing. We well done. OK. Um, yeah, we'll need to we'll kind of tie, tie these that three together. So I'll just keep coming through. You go, yeah, let it go and then... OK. It's probably, yeah. I think it's fine. Yeah, all okay. good. <laughs> Poor thing. Its wing's looking OK, so I'm going to let it go. Here you go. It's a life, same as all the animals we look after, so um, I still think it's important to look after them. Rescue successfully completed. I'll just drive quite home. It's back to the job of moving the trees closer to the owl enclosure, ready for the revamp. 
this time with a bit of extra muscle power on hand. I can grab that one. Oh, I'm really hot. <laughs> oh, I stood on my branch. <laughs> Down in Edinburgh, it's a couple of days since Sumatran tiger Luku's last training session. Oh, look at that lovely man. In preparation for his annual booster jag, today Alison plans to upgrade training from prodding him with a broom handle to something more like a real injection. He's been so good that we're just going to, I guess, push it, push it forward another wee bit. Uh, with them. This here, which we're doing very makeshift here, is a, a blunt needle. So obviously the cap's on it just now. Uh, but we've used it when we've trained a few other animals for blood draws. Right, we all happy? Today, senior keeper Andrew is on treat duty with Jade observing helping to get Luku used to having different people, noises and smells around him. Right, I've got the blunt needle with the cap on and I'm just pressing in, still pressing, he's actually pressing against me. <laughs> and off, good boy. He's an absolute diamond, he's been, he's been trained um, really well and trained to accept this and it's so very obvious. So this is a blunt needle, Andrew. I will we'll just touch him with it now. On now. However, it's worthwhile putting in those little tiny steps of training because um, you try and kind of cover everything that's going to happen on the day, uh, just to make sure that there's none of that is going to, going to spook him. I'm now jabbing a little bit, little bit, little bit. No reaction, no tail. Good boy. And to be perfectly honest with you, if he's accepting the blunt needle being jabbed into his thigh, he'll, he'll accept a needle without a problem. The, the vaccination's a very small amount and it's put in very quickly with a thin needle. And I will leave it at that. What a star. Good lad. Over at Penguin's Rock, things are hotting up in the Gen 2 breeding area. Already. They're really defensive of their nests. As soon as that nest ring goes down and that's their nest, that's it. They won't let any other penguins on them. Um, any penguin that comes near their nest to try and get in or steal a stone, there'll be a, there'll be a huge fight on that nest. Some of our older birds can be kicked off their nest because they just don't have it in them to fight against some of the young pairs that then come on. Get the occasional song. <laughs> This is Neville and Sonti. They're just singing with each other, um, saying, this is our nest, this is our territory. We are a pair. <laughs> but somebody just can't make up their mind. Every time I look, Snowflake's in a different nest. He's been there, 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 there. <laughs> Up at Highland Wildlife Park, polar bears Arctos and Victoria have been spending quality time together. Since their previous cub Hamish, the first polar bear to be born in the UK in 25 years, left the park a few months ago, staff are hoping his parents will rekindle their relationship. Interesting this morning. Yeah, what, what were they, you were saying they were? So they were sort of circling each other, so he would come to sniff her bum and then she was going to sniff his bum and so they were keeping going round and round um, and then she'll run off and then wait for him and then do it again. So it's been quite nice. Good, um, good. I got a couple of videos of that, but they're exhausted. They were totally flat out when I got here and they were standing on the pool after circling each other and she was like falling asleep, oh. her eyes were closing. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know if that means that they've been doing more overnight. Maybe they have Possibly. mated. Yeah. So yeah, right. It's quite exciting. Maybe they're just trying to stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping cosy isn't really an issue for these bears. Built for the Arctic with a thick layer of blubber under the skin and two layers of fur on the outside, they can withstand temperatures as low as minus 45. 
Oh no. Oh, I see you. Keep your distance. Yeah. <laughs> Was he protective like that? But when you're up here on your own? He's done it once to me. Um, I was in the holding pen uh -huh. um, and he was rolling around in front of her and then he got up and he stomped. Yeah, she's knackered, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but you've got time to hang out here a wee mm. bit today? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to try and watch them as much as possible. Yeah, brilliant. It's the beginning of breeding season right now. This is, you know, early, early days, so... What Emma's describing that she's seen is really encouraging. There's a hint of Barry White on the breeze. <laughs> <laughs> Leave them to it. In normal times, Highland Wildlife Park and Edinburgh Zoo would expect to welcome close to a million visitors each year. But this last year has been very different. It's been tough for everyone, and like many other charities, the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, which owns and runs both sites, has faced some serious challenges. However, things are looking up. It should be an exciting day. Um, this is the first time for two months that we've been completely open. So we're expecting a sold out day, 1,500 visitors, um, so, a busy day for the guys to get back in the swing of things, so it should be really exciting. We're hoping that after all of the lockdowns, shutting, opening again, closing again, <laughs> opening again, that this will be the last time and we'll just be open for uh, the future going forward now. Um, so, it's really exciting for the team to just get a bit of normality, get people back in, see the animals um, and just have a great day out. After a socially distanced morning huddle, we are open till five o'clock today, in case you didn't know. <laughs> the team here are so brilliant, so um, I've got complete faith in them always, so hopefully it goes well. It's time to welcome the first wave of visitors. Good morning, guys, in you come. Welcome. Hi there. We've just got to follow around for me there and just go to one of the staff members, that's great. Good morning, guys. That's great, guys, you want to head up to Frank at the back there? That's great, thank you. Enjoy, thanks so much. Oh, you've brought your own panda with you. <laughs> well, it's always a relief and everything goes smoothly and <laughs> they're all here and everyone's happy. It's just a nightmare with the, the mask because you want everyone to see that you're smiling and happy, <laughs> trying to do as much of that with your eyes as possible. All good around here? Yeah, all good. Teams of extra stewards have been laid on around the site coordinated by duty manager, Jonathan. By having stewards placed at different areas around the zoo, it means that the visitors will always come into contact with someone that they can ask questions to if they've got, if they need any directions, if they need any help and support. There's always somebody there or close by that they'll be able to, to get that information from. So I've been working here for about a year and a half. It's the only job that people have said you know, no day will, no two days will be the same, and it's been genuinely true. It's fantastic. I love working here. Is there, is there a penguin that's got um, skin for, like alopecia? So it? yes, um, somewhere within that program. mass of penguins is, is really snowflake. Pale? That's right. Yeah, snowflake. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find them. In fact, I can I see. If you look straight yeah. ahead. They're just sat in the nest. Oh, yeah, I can see it. Can you yeah. see? Yeah. Look, look at the building there, and then look at the white camera on the building, and then look down, and then a little bit to your oh, right. Yeah. That's it. Oh. It's just a little bit paler than the rest of them. It's amazing. Uh-huh. They're a cheeky one as well. Is it? Mm-hmm. It's just brilliant. Um, and we've, just, we've only been here for, like, 30 minutes, and we've just had a great time. Um, loving every single bit. And get to meet Jonathan, even better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you five later on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Meanwhile, back at base camp. Had about 1,100 visitors in so far. All seem to be going really smoothly, touch wood. Um, no major disasters, everyone seems to be really happy um, just getting through and getting them in. So, so far, so good. When the weather's nice and the zoo's full, the staff feel that energy as well, um, so they're happy too. <laughs> so um, it's kind of happy visitors, happy staff as well. So it's been a lovely morning. 
No, you're very excited that it's open again, aren't you? <laughs> it's like the highlight of our week, isn't it? <laughs> there are lots to go and explore, but so nice to do something normal for a change. What are we going to see first, do you think? The meerkats, oh yeah. <laughs> then flamingos. <laughs> and then the flamingos. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think we're going to have a little picnic as well. It just gets us back to, back to where we should be and getting everybody to enjoy the surroundings, to enjoy being here and, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. With the penguin breeding season now well underway, Don and Lorna's charges are hungrier than ever. So this is the blue fighting for the gentoos and the kings, and then the rock coppers get the smaller, smaller sprats. Uh, at this time of year, they're going through about uh, about four to six buckets in the morning, and last night they had 13 buckets, so definitely gearing up for their egg laying season. Dawn's dealing with vitamins and medication. Specific to each of the 124 penguins, it all needs to be hidden away in their food. For liquid medication, we pop any liquid into um, gel capsules, so it means we can pop that much easier into the, into the fish. And then we know it's not just going to leak out before the penguin can get it. She's using the team's tried and tested system of wrapping each medicated fish in an individually named paper towel. When that bird comes over, we know exactly which fish belongs to them, so we just pop it down the, down the gill. Don's first stop, the endangered northern rockhoppers, whose nest rings went down a week ago. Almost all of those left in the wild are thought to breed on a handful of tiny islands in the South Atlantic Ocean. We have 24 rockhoppers all together. Uh, we have 21 of them in this breeding setup, and then we've got our um, retirees who are still in the main exhibit. So we keep them out of here because it can be quite a hostile environment. And I don't think putting uh, some of our old ones through that is entirely fair. Some of the sprightly youngsters have rushed down for their sprats. <laughs> They're like young, angry teenagers. <laughs> so there's six established nests on this nest site. Um, and we've just got two eggs so far. And we have one on this nest here, and we have one on an end nest. Rockhoppers are unusual in that each pair will produce two eggs, but only the second is fertile, which means Dawn will be waiting eagerly for the second eggs to be laid. There's very few zoos that have northern rockhoppers and breed them successfully, so uh, they are a, a, an incredibly endangered species. Um, and their numbers are still on a decline out in the wild. So this is really important that we're able to establish a good captive colony um, as a, essentially a, a reserve. So if the worst happens and this species goes extinct in the wild, then we know we've still got the species that then we can do work with to get them then re potentially reintroduced. People don't necessarily always realise that they're helping directly with conservation of these species out in the wild by coming to the zoo, but that's one of the, the biggest and most important things of zoos nowadays is that we are trying to help save the species out in the wild. And 10-year-old Balboa seems to be taking his part in that very seriously. He's actually trying to get the female to lie down so he can mate her. <laughs> it's not, certainly not the gentlest of courtship, but if you're a rocket, it works. I would say to see a, a proper mating like that, you probably only see it maybe once a season. They're normally more uh, secretive about their mating. Gentoo is, uh, <laughs> you get sick of seeing it. With Highland Wildlife Park also gearing up to welcome back the public, keepers Emma and Robbie are making a start on the revamp of the Eurasian Eagle Owl enclosure. At the moment, we're getting all the old logs out, clean it up a wee bit, and then we're gonna start putting the new ones that we've collected in um, and make new like perching sites for them and places for them to feed. 
They're hoping to get it finished before the park's gates reopen in a few days. Yeah, I mean, just after the winter and everything, everything's tired and it's been in here a while now and it's you know, getting past its best now, so you just want to try and renew everything. Found throughout much of Europe, Asia and parts of North Africa, the Eurasian eagle owl suffered a serious decline in numbers during the 20th century, mainly due to human persecution. However, they're now a widely protected species and wild populations have started to recover. They were here when I came here and they've had a move. They were actually in the forest habitat, right in the corner area where now we're actually using for cats because we're using so many, uh, we've got so many wild cats now. Uh, it makes a bit more room, but uh, we found with the rocks and that in here, ideal area for them as well. Okay, I'm gonna, oosh. You're right. <laughs> no. Oh no. Oh, it's it fell all the way back. As long as it stops, it'll be fine. Emma is very aware of the effect the clean-up activity is having on the lads. So they're kind of a wee bit upset. You want to give them a wee rest now? Yeah, we'll give them ten minutes and uh, let them chill out for a bit. It looks better already. Aye. <laughs> yeah, and we've got some like little um, slices of log that we're going to put for like different perches and the different discs, places uh, to feed them. Um, so we can maybe take out a few stumps that are a little older once we've got enough of those in. Mm -hmm. um, and then give it a big rake and put some bark in, I think. Once Roger and Lyra have had time to settle... Remember to bend your knees, as our old gym teacher used to tell okay. us if you're lifting anything heavy. I'll tell you what, I'll measure it first. 11 and a toe. Okay. One, two, three. Excellent. What a team. That's nice. Yeah. Whew, I'm out of breath. <laughs> so if I put that up there. I so, think it's quite good like that, with the branches uh -huh. holding All on. Right. Yeah, I like it. That at an angle. I or... don't know how we'd attach it on there. I do. Do you? you just put a <laughs> screw through it. Aye. Okay. That's yeah. a professional Perfect. job. <laughs> professional job. <laughs> They're not too bad at the moment. Um, I think us giving them a little break helped. Not only are the owls keeping an eagle eye on proceedings, the new Desres is attracting interest from the neighbours. I don't know. Too long? Maybe. Just a few more in this corner, I think. Um, I think so. And then we need to attach that, and then we'll put all our perches on. Uh -huh. Aye. And then we put the discs on. Yeah. Could we put a few discs on there, maybe? Yeah, definitely. One in the, end, one in the middle. Yeah. Bob's your uncle. Fanny's your aunt. Yes. Aye. Right. Cool. Opening day at the park has arrived, and Sean from Visitor Services prepares to greet the eager public. Have you got a booking? Yeah. Yeah, is it on your phone? Yeah, if you can open it up down here because the signal market gates really poor. No pets or animals in your vehicle? Fantastic. Just make your way up. Cheers then. Obviously we have to check um, they're not out of area at the moment, that kind of thing. Check for animals, that kind of stuff as well. Oh yeah, we've had people trying to bring sheep in and things like that. Put in the wall over a ride, doesn't it? The weather's looking not looking too bad at the moment. It snowed yesterday, so things can only get better, can't they? Just over a couple of hundred today. They're all local. Uh, we check all the postcodes, make sure everybody's happy. Um, the general reaction from people coming in, it's like the cork out of the bottle. Everybody's, way. we can back, back to the park again. I think the animals miss us as well. I mean, it was, it was I was up uh, sorting out the tiger walkways for the last couple of days and they were bouncing around looking very curious as to what this person was, which they haven't seen for the last three months or so. the revamped eagle owl enclosure is attracting admirers. It's a little bit quieter just because we've just got the locals in just now but yeah it's nice to see new faces and seeing people getting excited about the animals again. It's feeling a bit like we're going a bit more back to normality so that's a nice feeling as well. <laughs> At the zoo, there's exciting news from the rockhopper penguin's nesting area. An important second egg has appeared. 
the first pair for us who have now laid both eggs um, are a pair called Amy and Gordon. They've been together for quite a few years and they've also had a few chicks with us, so they've definitely mastered the craft. Although it's said that it's always the second egg that's fertile, we've certainly found here that um, we very rarely, but occasionally, do get a first fertile egg. And we don't want to take that risk um, in discarding that first egg or putting that first egg to risk because they are such an endangered species. So what we do is we actually take the first egg and we pop it in an incubator. Hi, right, Amy. Can I have a wee look? You've got a second, your second wee eggy. Cool. So this is the second egg. So this is the one that we'll be leaving with her. So I'm just going to take it for two seconds. I'm just going to write a nice big number two on it. It's a second egg. We never turn the eggs. Um, it's really important that we don't turn them. So we're going to put a number on the bottom. So I've just wrote a number two underneath. And we just do a little eat. That's nest eight. So I'll just go and pop this back and then I'll collect our first egg. Hello, my darling. So when they're biting, you know, that's, they've got really sharp, dense, strong little beaks. Um, it really nips when they bite. <laughs> um, so this is the first egg. A little bit muckier than the, <laughs> the fresh second egg. Um, they tend to not really care about their first egg. Um, you will sometimes see pairs yeah, kicking the egg about the nest by mistake, not really paying much attention to it. But as soon as that second egg is laid, their, their behaviour completely changes and they become really settled. You know, they're incubating that egg really calmly. So we're going to take this to the incubator room now and set up an incubator and uh, leave the Rockies in peace. Once Dawn has measured the egg... 63 millimetres. Let me do the same again. Take it from the, the fat end. 44.3. She cleans off the worst of the muck. I just give it a, a little wipe, just to take off those big chunks, really. And gives the egg a unique identifier number. 02 slash 1 just means she was the second female to lay this year, and this is her first egg. Before she weighs it. 74.1 grams. And I'm quite happy with the temperature and the humidity in this incubator. It's exactly what I want it to be at. And that's it really. We'll come back in a week's time and we'll have another way of the egg to see if there's any development. Out of the nest for less than 30 minutes, Amy and Gordon's unwanted first egg is now safe and sound offering the possibility of another precious rockhopper chick. At Highland Wildlife Park, it's a waiting game to find out if polar bear Victoria is pregnant with Arctos's cub, or even cubs, as polar bears will often have two. In the meantime, keeper Emma is staying busy. You get to make a connection with them, um, so getting to know their different personalities, um, what they like, what they don't like. Being familiar with their behaviours can tell the keepers a lot about the animals in their care, and Emma's been watching Victoria closely for any changes. At the moment, what we're seeing from her, um, the last couple of days she's kind of not wanted him in her area, so she's been growling and doing little like charges at him, but she's not really meaning it. She'll like open her mouth and stuff as if she would bite his legs but um, she doesn't actually go through with it. It's more just showing who's boss and getting him away from her area. Oh. So that was what I was talking about with the sort of charging and roaring behaviour. Um, so she's definitely telling him off a lot. But Victoria blowing a bit hot and cold with Arctos doesn't seem to be anything to worry about. I wasn't working here when the polar bears bred last time, so I looked back in the records and we keep detailed notes of everything that goes on with the animals and that's been really helpful for me. What I've seen from the breeding season before is that Victoria and Arctos Aww. would be getting on really well and showing a lot of breeding behaviours 
um, and that would happen for a few weeks and then after that she would kind of push him away. <coughs> That's kind of what we're seeing this time as well. So it is completely normal. That really um, gives us quite a lot of hope that um, things might work out the same. They're still getting on well enough to eat next to each other when she's not roaring. And this morning, after I'd finished cleaning, they were lying fairly close together. If Victoria is already pregnant, uh, which we're really hoping that she is, it's understandable that she wants a little bit of space. In Edinburgh, Vet Simon and Steph have joined Alison and Justina at the Tiger Enclosure for Luku's annual booster jag. It's his first since he arrived at the zoo. Training of animals is a part of the job that I love. It can have its moments and it can be um, frustrating and you have to have the patience of a saint. Happy? But I love having an end goal that we, we have to get to and, and working the steps to get to because it's, it's different for not just different species but for every single individual you're working with. Um, if I could train animals all day, that's what I would do. Alison and Simon have been colleagues for over a decade and have built a strong working relationship. Do you want to come in and I'll show you where I've got them to and then you can... Just, you know, when he's like that, we might need to take him back up, feed him there, bring him back. And then right at that side, other, on the side, yeah. So we get them down. Good boy. So this is where I'm at. You just feed them there. And I've just been jab, 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 jab. And doing it with the cap off as well. So, yeah, I'll jab them on this as well. Jab, jab, jab. And we're not really getting anything. So if you're happy enough, just seeing the needles just going in now. An unsuccessful first attempt. But with a slight readjustment. Yeah, you need to move them up again. And then. Simon makes it look easy second time round. And he's ready to make a speedy exit. Done. Good as that. Good boy. I think it's probably true to say that some of the animals aren't fond of vets. So once that procedure's over, we like to just quietly leave uh, so that there is minimal association uh, on his part uh, with us and anything that uh, may have upset him. Nobody likes an injection. They're necessary, but uh, clearly Alison has done a, a, you know, a really good job in uh, being able to train Luku to uh, accept a, a hand injection. It's a, it's a difficult thing to do. As you could see, when the needle first was going in, he kind of pulled away a little bit, but we just stay nice and calm, persevere with it, keep feeding, move him back into position so he's leaning against it again. And, um, yep, yeah, it's, you know, it's a quick injection to do, so... Um, but, yeah, fabulous, great, really, really pleased. The last three weeks have been very busy in the Gen 2 breeding area. It's been really active um, since we put the nest rings down. We've had a lot of fighting and squabbling over nests, but they've all started to settle in nicely now. They've um, filled all their nests with stones, and uh, in actual fact, we've had our first egg laid today. So one of our young females, called Muffin, she's laid our, our egg this year, so she's the first one to go. And we normally find that once the first female lays, it spreads. <laughs> so we hopefully should see, start seeing eggs being laid pretty much every day now. Like rockhoppers, Gen 2s tend to lay two eggs. But unlike rockhoppers, both will be fertile and cared for by the parents. Dawn still needs to check and number the egg, but getting hands on it requires a bit of cooperation. Some of our older birds, they know that even just our gesture of just lifting them up by the chest slightly and underneath. Most of our older birds will just stand up because they know what's happening. Whereas younger birds takes a little few a few year seasons to, to learn that behaviour. So she might put up a little bit of a fight. Hi guys. Hi Muffin. You got a wee egg? Oh, have you got a wee egg? You do. Lovely. So you bend down. Nice and calm. Let her have a wee sing. 
I'll give her one of my, my hand, just so I can make sure that the beak's safe, and I use the back of the hand to lift the bird, and that means I can stretch under and also shield the egg with my hand. Um, we don't want the egg to be pecked by the penguin at the same time. So I've got a China Graph pencil. I'm going to put a big number one on it, and that's because it's egg number one. All right, so I'll just pop that back under muffin. Good girl. Yes, I know. Okay. She's very protective, and rightly so. This is uh, a very precious egg to her, um, and then hopefully in a month or so we'll see uh, chicks hatch. Like many birds, Muffin has a special brood patch to help her incubate her eggs successfully. They've got a little area of a fold of skin and that she'll have plucked all the little feathers out to expose that skin. Um, and there's increased blood flow to that area of skin to, to get it nice and warm. And she's essentially targeted that bit of skin so it's sitting now on that egg and that's what's keeping that egg warm. So she's readjusting herself to make sure that she's not going to crush her egg but also that she wants the egg in the right position. But not everything is what it seems. Behind the scenes of proud parenting, a different drama is playing out. We've actually seen this year um, a couple of changes of uh, partners. Um, so we have uh, Mr and Mrs Spain, who have been a pair for many, many years. I've had many chicks together. Um, this year, actually, a young, a young female called Spud has actually moved in on the nest and stolen Mr. Spain off of Mrs. Spain, which is very sad to see. Like, we feel really bad for her. <laughs> um, another pair split up, which were called Stephen and Boo. A young female called Holly has now come in and stolen Stephen off of her, so there must, just be, there must be something in the air this year. <laughs> we always kind of compare it to you know, watching a soap, <laughs> a soap opera on telly because there's so much, I don't know, there's, there's cheating left, right and centre, and there's stealing of stones, and there's fighting, and um, I've never known a species to be so unfaithful to their partners as penguins. It's like they're one of the worst. Always a firm favourite with visitors, the zoo's Chilean flamingos are one of six species from around the world. Loss of habitat due to human activities such as agriculture and mining, as well as illegal egg collecting, are big factors in the decreasing number of Chilean flamingos in the wild. The word flamingo originates from Portuguese, translating as red goose. This perky bunch are due their annual health check, a challenging event that keepers Nick and Liz are making preparations for. We're just going to get the scale set up, so when we get the flamingos from outside, we'll bring them in here, we'll weigh them, and then we'll take them out to the vet. Makes weighing a tall bird with long spindly legs and sharp beak sound simple. Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll get the flamingo caught up, bring them in. We'll use a cover just to give them a bit of security as well. Nick's only moved from hoofstock to birds in the past three weeks, so today's health check will be a big learning curve for him. I have done it before, but this time I'm here for the whole duration. I was only here towards the end last time, so by the time I got down here, there's about five to do, so now there's 27, so <laughs> yeah, it's going to be an interesting hour or so, I think. An hour? Is that, you, that's about how long it takes, isn't it? Fingers crossed, yeah. Oh, right, could it take more? <laughs> no, we'll fly we're gonna, it. It's going to we'll definitely take it out. We'll it'll it no definitely problem. take it out. Nick's first job this morning was to herd the flamingo flock up from the main enclosure to a holding pen. I've never done it before, so I didn't know how it was going to go, but they're obviously well trained. They just, I just walked them in. So just, they know once you walk down to a certain part of the enclosure, they just head to the other part because they don't want to go anywhere near you. So then I just walked them in and, yeah, just shut the gates behind them. Easy, easy enough. So we're just waiting at the moment for the vets to come down so we can do the health checks and colleagues as well, just to help us out, make the process as quick as possible. Colleagues could be coming from the bird section, primate section, any section really, because we all help each other out. With two vets, vet nurses and keepers to catch, weigh and hold the birds during their checkup, things get cosy rather quickly. First stop for the birds after being caught is the weighing room. 
And it's all a bit undignified. Who's that? <laughs> And as checking the microchips, so each um, animal is individually identified with a microchip, so similar to your cattle dog would be microchipped, so all zoo animals uh, by law have to be individually identified, uh, and so if they're big enough then they have a little microchip. Um, so we're just checking that that's working. Um, we're cleaning off the feet so that we can see them clearly uh, and see any uh, areas of calluses and things like that on the underside of the foot. We're taking a photograph so we've got a visual record uh, against so the little whiteboard you'll see is their individual identifier number which was insert underneath the feet. Grand, good to go, yep, thank you. We use that as an opportunity to uh, physically examine them. Um, so yes, you know, eyes, uh, mouth, beak, um, uh, wings, feathers, legs, etc., etc. Listen to them as well. Listen to lungs and heart, and really just give them a, a you know a, a thorough MOT. Um, a, a few of them have got little scabs on the legs as well, so we're just checking that. He has that a small wound I know, I no on his joint. I just clean it. <laughs> now I'm just applying it. It's skin glue, just to keep it in the place. It does get very busy. <laughs> but I think the sooner we can do it, then the less stress it is on the, on the birds. They're not birds that you can get close to um, on a regular basis. With the health check for all of the birds, we look at everything from their feet to their feather condition. So this one's a three. Lovely. There you go. Good job. Yep. Done a bit of the weighing part, done a bit of the catching part, and done a bit of the, the check part. So yeah, it's going well. But there's been one unforeseen downside to Nick's day. I've been cold for approximately three hours and 10 minutes. I've made some bad choices in life that I need to go and amend, I think. But I was told it was going to be nice. And there's nothing worse than working and you've been having too many clothes on and getting too hot. So I'm freezing. This is going to finish and I'm going to go to have a break and put a jump on, I think, because I'm very cold. Mm -hmm.